Hey everyone, before it all starts, I'm just gonna let you know this is actually a re-upload of a video that I did a couple of weeks back, I think it was about a week and a half, two weeks ago, for a sample section three walkthrough video. Uh, it's set number four uh, on the resources page. Someone let me know in the comments that on the second unit, I made a very, very stupid mistake where I converted tons into grams, but called it kilograms. I must have gone into autopilot on like chemistry mode or something and then just assumed to go into grams, said that 2.5 tons was 2.5 million kilograms, but it should be 2.5 thousand. So that kind of then changes up the answers as well. So I've edited the questions and what this is, is just a re-upload. Most of the video itself is actually still the original. When we get to unit two though, uh, I'll pop back in again uh, as I am now and we'll go through it with the proper solutions. It'll be re-uploaded to the resources page as well. So there's no confusion. Just thought I'd let you know that one. All right, I'll uh, throw back to my old self from a week or two ago. Welcome back to another video. If you're new here and you don't know who I am, my name is Jesse. I am a tutor in Melbourne and I make videos for Gamsat. Uh, I sat in March of 2021. Uh, it was actually my third sitting. I sat a couple of times a few years ago, back in 2012 and 13. Um, this time around, uh, I achieved an 84 and a 100 in section three. And so what I do is given my tutoring background, I figured I would make a bunch of free resources on YouTube to help people prepare for section three. Uh, there's obviously a huge, huge need for it. And unfortunately, most of the resources that are available are all paid. And in this one, we're gonna be going through a bunch of sample questions that I've written up that hopefully reflect the actual ASA material for section three. Uh, I've already put them up onto my resources page, which I'll link below. So if you do wanna do them first and then watch this through as a work solutions video, then by all means go ahead. You can also pause the video and then give it an attempt and then click play and kind of see the, the work solution as I work through them. Uh, the other aim for this video is not just work solutions, but also to kind of show how I would tackle a particular question. Um, it's a little bit tricky because obviously I've written them myself, so I know where they're headed. So I've written them in a way that they use uh, a bunch of different problem solving techniques or methods to kind of cover all the different ways that I looked at questions in section three and that helped me then achieve the score that I did. Okay, so what we're gonna do first is go through here. I've got unit one, um, and this is set number four on the resources page now, is we've got the half-life of a drug is the time required to reduce the blood plasma concentration of the drug to half of its original value. Uh, recently, studies have demonstrated that a more accurate parameter in pharmac uh, pharmacokinetics, bit of a tongue twister, is the terminal half-life, which is defined as the time required for the blood plasma concentration to reduce by 50% after it has reached pseudo equilibrium of distribution. So there's obviously a lot of jargon in there, right? So the first thing that I would be doing is kind of making note, and obviously you can't highlight on the new computer test, but um, maybe make notes on the scrap paper if you needed it, is we've already defined the half-life. For me, I would look at that and go, okay, I'm already familiar with that concept, right? Uh, the second part though, it then talks about a terminal half-life and that is a new term. So we can see here, it's still talking about reduction by 50%. So I'm gonna link that to my knowledge of half-lives, but clearly it's differentiating it from a standard half-life. It says that this is after it's reached some pseudo equilibrium of distribution, which truthfully, if uh, I hadn't written this question, I would have no idea what that meant. I'm sure many people right now are thinking, I don't know what that is. Either it'll be defined in the question if you need it, or else you can kind of get past it by just using the term without really knowing the specifics of what it means. It just becomes a handle or a reference within the question. So then we've got terminal half-life can be calculated as, so obviously really important. Uh, but again, let's just jump straight to what the variables are. We can see a natural log of two and lambda z represents the slope of the terminal phase, which again, a whole lot of stuff that we're not familiar with. So we're just gonna kind of make note of that for the moment. Uh, and then the terminal half-life has also been shown to depend on the volume of distribution, VD and uh, plasma clearance C, and so can be calculated according to the equation, blah, 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 right? So two different ways to calculate them. So we'll pay attention to these formulas. The next thing then, it goes on for quite a bit. Um, we've also got the figure below represents the steady state that can be achieved by multiple drug dosings over a period of eight days. And we've got a graph here. I've referenced it if you wanted to go there, but I would probably recommend not clicking the link right now because some of the answers may be revealed uh, if you read through the original article. But if you're interested, because it's quite an interesting study, um, then you could always reread the original source. Uh, so we've got here, again, with graphs, I've mentioned this before, I usually don't read them too heavily. I look straight to my variables so I can see I've got time in days, concentration being measured, makes sense. 
Uh, and then I've got three different graphs. So we've got 24 hours, 12 hours and infusion. And it says here, a drug was administered using multiple dosings uh, at, that should say at, I've got to change that, uh, 12 hour and 24 hour intervals. So now I know what they mean. And as well as with constant infusion uh, over an eight day period, a lot of little typos again. So now I know, right, so 12 hour interval, 24 hour interval, and one that was just constant as well. And then we've got additional info. So here we go, pseudo equilibrium of distribution. It's now defining it for us. So is the state after which a drug's concentration initially declines after administering, administering due to distribution to the kidneys, but the total amount of drug in the body remains the same. So that's a lot, that's quite heavy. I'd probably just make note of where that definition definition is. And anytime I'm gonna come back to the pseudo equilibrium, I'm just gonna to refer to that if I need to double check. It's also helped us out by saying the natural log of two is 0.693. They always do this in the ACER questions. They don't expect you to be able to really accurately work with decimals, um, approximation if anything, but there's no need to memorize the natural log of two or anything like that. They've always defined it. Uh, and then we've got volume of distribution measured in liters is defined as the amount of drug in uh, the body, the body it should be, uh, divided by the plasma concentration of the drug in milligrams per liter. And then plasma clearance in liters per hour is the volume of plasma passing through the kidneys per hour. You might, if you've done physiology, already be familiar with that. But again, this is first year biology. Um, so they define that for us as well, or I've put that into the question. So if we go to the questions now, which of the following is true regarding terminal half-lives? So we've got a bunch of different statements. I'm just gonna go through and check the validity as we, as we go through each one. So terminal half-lives are shorter than half-lives. So obviously that's to do with this terminal half-life formula here, either this one or this one. And there was nothing in there really about them changing. So both of these measure terminal half-lives. Half-life was just the time required to reduce uh, the blood concentration down to half of its original amount. This one was the same kind of concept, but it was after some distribution had occurred. So there's no information telling us about the actual time interval as to whether it is shorter, longer, or equal. So that immediately just rules out the first two. And maybe you might want to put them in the maybe pile and not rule them out immediately. But um, in this case, I would be going, probably not the answer. I'll look for something that's more correct, that has more evidence going for it. Uh, then we have the terminal half-life of a drug is measured in hours. So with that one, that's a units question effectively. So it becomes more mathematical. So here, this one was a natural log. This here just said the slope. So that doesn't really help me because I don't have any units to work with. Um, I know it's in some kind of time, but I don't know whether it's in hours, seconds, minutes, or days. So the graph might be a little bit misleading because it says it's measuring things in days, but it doesn't necessarily mean the half-life is measured in that unit. If we look to this formula though, we can see this has no units. The volume of distribution was defined in liters and the plasma clearance was liters per hour. So really I can already see that um, the time unit is in hours, but let's just prove that liters divided by liters per hour. And that would be liters times hours per liter effectively to divide by a fraction, the liters cancel, and there we go, half-life is measured in hours. So that would be the most correct. And then we can also rule out the last one anyway. High plasma uh, clearance will give a longer terminal half-life. So if you think about it, that would mean that you're increasing this here, that should actually decrease the half-life uh, because they're inversely related in the formula. So they should move in opposite directions. So that would not make any sense at all right? High plasma should actually shorten half-life rather than give it a longer one. So that rules that one out. So then with question two, the slope of the terminal phase, there's a lot of typos, man. I need to, I need to fix those. They'll all be fixed on the thing by the time this is uploaded. Um, the slope of the terminal phase is equivalent to, now we saw that word before, it mentioned it here. This was the slope of the terminal phase. And it's asking us to re-express it in another way. And it's linking it to VD, which was the volume of distribution, and C, which was the clearance rate as well. So what we can do here on this one, again, another maths one, I'd go, well, if these two are equivalent, then I can just make them equal to each other. So that means that the natural log of two divided by lambda Z, which is what we wanna solve, uh, should be the same thing as natural log of two times VD on C, if I put in the variables. 
the natural log can cancel because it's on both sides and we end up with one on lambda. I'll leave off the Z now just because it's a bit quicker. It's VD on C. So if I want lambda, then I just have to invert everything. So therefore lambda is equal to oops, C on VD like that. And so that gives me D and I don't have to check the others. Any maths ones, you can usually just solve them. You don't have to test answers. Uh, then number three, the half-life of the drug represented in figure one is approximately. So we're going to go to figure one. We're looking for the half-life. So we can see that it was being dosed uh, every 12 or 24 hours. The infusion one is not going to help because we're not going to get to see the decay rate at all because it's constantly being upped. And so uh, if I look at, for example, I'm going to go with this section here because it starts at 100. Right, and that's a nice clean number. I know that it should reach 50 after one half-life. And so if I look to what it's gotten to, to here, for example, that is roughly 50% or 50, I should say, 50 units, which is half um, of its proportion. And so that has happened in one day. So that would mean then the half-life should be 24 hours. Now, that one's a good example of one where I've just kind of made the question for the sake of GAMSAT. If you actually look at the link I can reveal now, it actually talks about a 48 hour half-life for it. But um, again, we don't need to know any of the specifics that might've been explaining that. We just have to look to the graph and be able to read a graph and understand how to work backwards to solve things like half-lives and stuff. Okay, so question four, uh, if a particular drug is administered to a patient at 10 a.m. and only 25% of its initial concentration in the blood remains at two, and their volume of distribution is known to be 2.2 liters, an approximation of their kidney's clearance rate would be. So I'm just gonna ignore all the typos that are, that are in there and fix those later. Uh, so first of all, I'd be looking at trying to draw out all of the key information from it. Uh, and so the first thing is I can see here, starts at 10 a.m. and we're recording at 2 p.m. So we've got a four hour gap, right? Four hours. And by that point, it's down to 25% of its initial concentration. So that would represent two decay cycles. So in other words, two lots of a half-life. So these are gonna be equal. So now I know if two half-lives is four hours, then that means that the half-life must be two hours. So that's the information to help me out there. Everything they give you is really just like tools to work out missing information. And sometimes you have to go through a series of calculations to get there. Um, Another thing that you can do is just look straight to what they're asking you for and go, where did I see clearance rate? The only place that it was actually mentioned was in this formula. So therefore you must have to know all the other variables in that formula in, a, in, able, in order to be able to solve it. So if we write that down, T half is natural log of two multiplied by VD on C and we're trying to solve for C. So I can just do a switch here switch these out so C then is going to equal the natural log of 2 times VD over T half. So the natural log we were given 0.693 multiplied by VD which was given as 2.2 litres all in the correct units as well uh, and then the half-life was in uh, hours so that was 2 and then what I can do here is just kind of 0.693 I can equate these as roughly 1 2.2 divided by 2 is basically 1 uh, and so therefore around about 0.7. If I wanted to be more accurate, it's technically 1.1. So then I can just call this 0.7 times that by 1.1. I'm adding 10%. So 0.77, which is around about 0 0.8 liters per hour. And there we go. So this then would be A like that. And so again, another maths question, you don't have to test every single answer. I would only do that if I had no idea what to do. Um, I was trying to come at it backwards. Whenever you're solving, you can just solve straight to the answer without having to check the others. If you're comfortable with your maths, just do that and then just move on. Uh, and the last one in this set is consider the following statements regarding terminal half-lives and steady states. So we've got terminal half-lives are dependent. What I often do here is I skip over this. I go straight to the statement, see if it's true, if I'm looking for true or false statements and then tick them off as I go. So terminal half-lives are dependent upon dosage interval. So where did I see dosage interval? That was in the graph. So if I look there, I'm comparing these two really more than anything. Did that affect the half-life? From what I can see, no, right? We could actually prove the half-life was exactly the same because on this one, it dropped by about a quarter or so in half a day, 
And so therefore we could assume that it would drop another quarter because it looks to be roughly linear um, to half its value in one full day, Oop, in one full day like that, which that was giving us that half-life of 24 hours. If we looked at the other one, which we used before, that one was dropping to about 50% in one day. So it meant that the dosage interval didn't seem to be impacting it whatsoever. So that one is actually going to be false because it says it is dependent. So that one's out. Uh, the time taken to reach steady state is relatively unaffected by dosage interval. So if we look at that there, time taken to reach steady state, which is where it's kind of flattening out. And you can see all three graphs roughly reaching it here. You could say maybe seven days or so, but it, there's not really any significant difference. There's a slight difference here, but they're all about the same. So that one actually looks pretty true because it says relatively unaffected. That's the key word there. So that one's all good. And then a patient with kidney failure will require more frequent dosage intervals to achieve steady state. So this is a little bit linking on existing knowledge of what the kidneys actually do. Um, and that is their job is to filter out drugs, right, from the system. So if someone's got kidney failure, we can assume that they're not clearing the, uh, the drug as quickly, which would mean linking it to this, there's always gonna be a direct link. It means their clearance rate is gonna be lower. Right, So if they've got a low clearance rate like that, we can see what that does to the impact. What that does is it means that it'll increase because they're inversely related. It'll increase the half-life, which means that the drug decays at a slower rate in them, which means they shouldn't have to require as frequent dosage because their body's not able to clear it as quickly as the average person. So a patient with kidney failure will require more frequent. No, they'll actually require less frequent in that case. So that one makes that wrong. And so the only answer is two, making B the correct answer. All right, uh, back in. So here we go. So fixing up the error here, let's have a look at unit two. Hydrogen gas is a highly volatile molecule that when unpressurized fills a large volume, given it has a, a number of uses as a fuel, storage of hydrogen needs to be done both safely and resourcefully. Hydrogen is commonly kept in pressurized tanks, although the costs associated with this are becoming economically unviable for many energy producers. And so they're looking at alternatives to existing pressurized tanks and equipment. Uh, one suggested solution is the storage of hydrogen vessels in the ocean in order to make use of the hydrostatic pressure of the water above it, according to the equation P equals rho G H, where rho is the density of the water, G is the value of gravity, and H is the depth of the water. One issue with this solution is that because hydrogen is significantly less dense than water, in order to submerge the vessel, a weight will need to be placed on top of the vessel to help overcome the buoyancy force Fb, which is also given in a formula as well, where V is the volume of water that is displaced by the vessel. So assuming that the density of water is one kilograms per litre, uh, and then also assume that gravity is 10 newtons per kilo, they often do this because the real value of 9.8, 9.81 is too specific for what we actually need. The weight of the hydrogen vessel is two and a half tons, there it is, and has an overall density of nine by 10 to the negative five uh, kilograms per liter. The vessel will be stored at a depth of 40 meters as well. So they're giving us some numbers here. I'm giving you some numbers in the question. So first of all, what volume of water will be displaced by the vessel when fully submerged? Uh, yeah, so what volume of water will be displaced by the vessel when fully submerged? So the first thing is, technically, even though there's weights and there's densities and all the rest of it, the volume of water that will be displaced is just going to be the volume of the vessel, right? There's going to be no difference in that. So if we look at the uh, vessel, it said that it was two and a half tons, but it has an overall density of nine by 10 to the negative five. So we know that density is mass per volume. So if we want the volume, we can switch out these two here and we can say that volume then is mass divided by density. So the mass is 2.5 tons, which this time I'm gonna get it right. 2.5 by 10 to the three kilograms, because we're in physics where kilograms is the standard unit for mass. And uh, rho, the density was uh, nine by 10 to the negative five, like this, okay? And so then from there, what I like to do with uh, these is stick with the scientific notation, but just split it. So 2.5 over nine, and then here we can use index laws. We can subtract the powers because they've both got the same base. So three minus a negative eight, oh sorry, negative five is uh, eight. So therefore we get 10 to the eight like that. And then finally we look at this. So 2.5 over nine is, I'm gonna estimate that to be 
effectively three over nine to make life a little bit easier. Because again, we're ballparking here. Three ninths is one third by 10 to the eight or 0 0.33 by 10 to the eight. But really 2.5 is a little bit less than three ninths. So 0.33, it'll probably be around, I'm just gonna go 0.3 by 10 to the eight which if I convert that, that would be three by 10 to the seven. I can move this one spot over and then reduce this by one, like that to adjust to make sure I'm still talking about the same number. So we get three by 10 to the seven liters. And so therefore the answer is B on that one. So probably a type of question that would be kind of pushing it in terms of your free space available uh, on the scratch paper for sure. But I'm trying to show every step so you can see the reasoning. Realistically, you can skip steps as much as you're comfortable. Uh, what mass will be required to fully submerge the vessel? Okay, so the first thing I can do, we've got a mass that's pushing down on the vessel. So if we've submerged it, it now has 40 meters of water sitting above it, pushing down with a hydrostatic pressure, right? That'll be downwards. You've got buoyancy force pushing back up against it, which is rho g h or rho g v, rho g v. This force here is rho g h, and the rho is the density of water in this case. Um, and then we have, uh, as well as that, the mass that's pushing down, which we're gonna try and solve m times g. So if we work all of that out, the idea is that so long as the downward forces are equal or greater than the buoyancy force, you'll be able to then overcome the buoyancy because it's trying to push against it and you'll be able to submerge it. So we can create a formula for question seven, which I might just do down here. Oh, and then you've also got the gravitational force uh, of the actual vessel as well. So we've got the gravitational force of the vessel plus the rho g h, the hydrostatic pressure, plus this mass of this extra mass that we're putting on top. All of that has to be equal or greater to the rho g v, the buoyancy force pushing back up. And so we're really just trying to solve for this mass right here, right? So the, the gravitational force of the vessel is gonna be its mass, which was 2.5 by 10 to the three kilos multiplied by 10, gravity. Plus then you've got the weight of the water pushing down. So that has a density of one kilo per liter. So we're gonna put one times by 10 for gravity times by 40, plus then mass times gravity, we don't know what that mass is, so I'm just gonna put 10 times m, should be equal to the uh, density of the water over here times 10 times the volume displaced. And the volume displaced we got before was three by 10 to the seven. Three by 10 to the seven, like that. And now it's just a case of solving for the mass. So we wanna use a lot of the scientific notation here. So here we could get 2.5 by 10 to the four, because so we can merge these two and use an index law. Plus, now this one here is 400. Relative to the other numbers, that is absolutely minuscule. So really I can just kind of remove that because it's insignificantly small, right? It's not really gonna play a big role and it's multi-choice here. Plus 10 M, we don't know what that mass is gonna be. It has to be equal to, and so here I can do one times three is three, times 10, two, and then we've got 10, one and seven makes eight, three by 10 to the eight. So now I can go with 10 M is equal to three by 10 to the eight, take away 2.5 by 10 to the four, from the vessel's weight force. And again, these are massively out of order. There's a, an order of four, right? Four orders of magnitude difference. This is effectively zero, right? It's barely gonna affect it. So if it was to be within two, like two uh, orders of magnitude, then I'd probably factor it in, but anything more than that, and in this case, it's not gonna have an impact. So then that means that effectively, it's not gonna do anything to it. It's gonna be three by 10 to the eight. And so, Lastly, then we just divide the 10 across. So divide by 10, and we're just doing an index law here, subtracting one from the powers, and we get three by 10 to the seven. And so that would be the mass required for the mass to submerge it. So then lastly, we have question eight. If instead the vessel was designed such that it could compress under force with a compressive constant of three liters per 100 newtons, what would the new density be at a depth of 40 meters still? So holding everything else constant, this compressive force just means that every group of 100 newtons leads to a three liter reduction in its volume. And if its mass is staying constant, but its volume is reducing, we can expect that its density should go up. So already our answer should be greater than nine by 10 to the negative five. So we can actually already rule out A, because that's smaller. 
This is a little bit bigger, so that looks pretty good. Um, this one is definitely a lot smaller. Uh, sorry, a lot. Uh, where are we? A lot bigger still, because we're in negative negative powers. So this one is uh, a little bit bigger. So that's a possibility. This one's actually gigantic. That's ten to the nine. So I'd already be a little bit wary of that. And this one here is the exact same. So we know that there's a big force being applied. So it's probably not going to stay the same. So it's going to be B or C. But we can do that. So all we have to do is work out, all right, well, what compressive force is being applied? And then just divide that into groups of 100 and then times that by three liters for every one of those hundreds, right? And then we've got our new volume. And we can recalculate the new density. So really, we already did a force diagram here. We've already got all the forces contributing, right? So if I add all of that up, because they're all going to be contributing to the compression of it, we had, uh, we did them over here, it was... 2.5 by 10 to the 4 plus then we had the rho gh which was really nothing so again I'm probably not going to factor that one in uh, plus then here we had 10 uh, times the mass which was 3 by 10 to the 8 so 10 by 3 to the 8 is 3 by 10 to the 8 sorry 10 by 3 to the 7 is 3 by 10 to the 8 plus then we've also got the buoyancy force which would also be contributing to compression because they're working against each other and squashing the vessel so if it's in like a rubber balloon that can change our volumes then we've also got another 3 by 10 to the 8 from the buoyancy so again looking at this these two are relatively insignificant we add these two together they're both in the same order of magnitude so we can just do 3 plus 3 is 6 by 10 to the 8 and this would be the new force that's being applied if we then divide that up into groups of 100, we're really dividing that by 10 to the 2. So we can apply an index law. It's 6 by 10 to the 6. Uh, lots, I'll say lots of 100 newtons. And each one of those contributes to a 3 litre reduction. So that would mean that we would have 6 by 10 to the 6 times 3. And that would give us 18 by 10 to the 6 or 1.8 by 10 to the 7. Uh, liters reduction. The original volume we worked out was 3 by 10 to the 7. So if we had a 3 by 10 to the 7 thing and then we lost 1.8 by 10 to the 7, 3 minus 1.8 is 1.2 by 10 to the 7 liters. And then finally the mass didn't change. So the density, mass divided by the new volume, uh, the mass was 2.5 tons, so 2.5 by 10 to the 3 divided by 1.2 by 10 to the 7 and again we can use index laws here so 2.5 divided by 1.2 you know 2.4 divided by 1.2 would be 2 so I'm going to say 2 and a bit right might say 2.1 just in case uh, and then here 3 minus 7 is negative 4 2.1 by 10 to the negative 4 and I'm just going to go with the one that's closest to it so the only one that is in the ballpark is C like that, right? I'll probably change the wording so it actually says is closest to rather than will be. There might be a slight error because again, uh, I don't think I updated this question. So the numbers might've changed and I might've been planning for it to be exactly C, but uh, we'll change that to um, closest to. The more important thing to take from this is the reasoning with the way that the forces work for people who are new to physics or people who are pretty well versed in physics and are just looking to kind of find easy ways to do it. Yes, there's a lot of calculation, but remember that I'm, as I said before, I'm showing every single step. Realistically, I wouldn't be writing every one of those. Try to do a lot more of it in your head. All the index law stuff with scientific notation can be done quite quickly in your head without writing. That's why you want to do it that way. The less you write, the better, right? But this is just so that people can see the full, the full working for it. Cool. All right, there we go. Well, that one's fixed. That's all updated. I will now hand back again. Uh, to myself from a couple of weeks ago and you can do the last question uh, and I will see you in the next one. See you guys later. Question that's not a real one. Um, I've put it in there. It's not a real question because you wouldn't really be expected to go through the reasoning like this, but I just thought it'd be a fun one to go through. It does use a little bit of bio at the same time. Um, they never really do many like med related ones anyway. And this is somewhat like an ethical thing of there's a yes and a no. So we're just going to go through it and think about how you'd reason it. Uh, angiotensin 2 is an enzyme that causes vasoconstriction, narrowing of the blood vessels uh, to 
uh, upregulate blood pressure. When angiotensin is active, it constricts the blood vessels and increases pressure, which increases the required contractile force of the heart to pump blood. Uh, angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE inhibitors are a class of medications that inhibit the action of angiotensin and are commonly used to treat high blood pressure. So in terms of note taking, what I'd be doing is I'd just be writing like ANG2 and then I'd just write, well, actually no, that'd be a bit confusing. I'd just write vasoconstrict and I might put like increase BP and then I can just put ACE inhib and put a little block on it like that to remind myself of what it all represents. So in a hospital, there are four patients with a variety of complications as summarized. A bit like the statements thing, I just go straight to what I need to do with them. How many patients could be reasonably treated using an ACE inhibitor? So we've just got to kind of take this information and look at safety precautions of each one. So patient one is suffering from syncope, a condition that involves passing out from sudden drops in blood pressure. So if you were to give them an ACE inhibitor, this would not allow them to raise their blood pressure, which would mean their blood pressure would remain low or lower. Um, and so therefore that would not be good because that would exacerbate the problem. They've got low blood pressure already. We don't want to make it lower. So that would not be a good patient to give it to. Patient two is suffering from renal failure in their kidneys and has a below average blood volume level. So if they have low blood volume, that would mean they have low blood pressure. So again, we would not want to give them that. And you can see now we've created a bit of a rule. Now we know that low blood pressure means don't give them ACE inhibitors because if you give them an ACE inhibitor, uh, that's actually gonna keep the blood pressure low or prevent it from being upregulated to fix the problem. So again, we would not wanna give patient two uh, that particular drug. Patient three is suffering from acute angina, a chest pain that when experienced feels similar uh, to a weight pressing down on the sternum or the chest area. So with this one, uh, there's no mention of uh, blood pressure or anything, but it's talked about chest pain, right? Uh, and so it mentioned about when you use angiotensin, that increases the force required on the heart. So if there's any pain coming from the heart, you probably wouldn't want to put it under more strain. If we were to use just a basic line of reasoning, um, like, I mean, just like you, I'm not in medical school or anything, didn't get in this year, so don't take this as medical advice. And I'm sure there's probably things that would say uh, opposite to what I'm going to say, but we're just going to use what we'll call GAMSAT reasoning. Um, and we're just going to go straight on the basic facts and theory that's presented. If someone has chest pain, we would not want to increase the force on the heart required. So in that case, then angiotensin does that. Therefore, ACE inhibitor does the reverse. That should relieve the pain, right? So um, that would mean that you can increase the blood pressure. So we'll give them that. So if you give them an ACE inhibitor, this will prevent their blood pressure from rising, which will mean that it should stay low, which should hopefully alleviate some of the pressure on the heart itself and maybe maybe fix the angina. I don't know. Again, uh, patient four is currently on blood thing medication after surgery to prevent blood clots. So they're trying to prevent blood clots. They've already got thinned blood. Um, if they don't have the ACE inhibitor, then it means that they can raise their blood pressure. If they do have the ACE inhibitor, it means that they can't. And it means their blood pressure stays very low. In terms of blood clots, you actually would want higher pressure with thin thin blood because then you'll like thinning it means that you'll prevent the blood clots. Slow moving blood is more likely to clot. High moving blood um, is less likely to clot. Obviously there's links to high blood pressure and blood clotting and that kind of thing from smoking and heart disease and all the rest of it. But again, we're just going to use that basic reasoning. Really, you could argue with me on that and say that patient four should not be given it because it's just safer to use something else. So really the answer might be one. Um, I'm going to go with patient four. Hopefully I haven't killed them or anything or else maybe I should never be a doctor. Uh, and um, that's that's kind of the reasoning to go through there. So like I said, don't take that one as gospel. Um, that's really not uh, an ACER type question. I just thought it'd be interesting to go through, test your reasoning. Um, and it's more of a reading one than it is a kind of math science one. Um, so a lot of it is based on the, the words and the kind of qualitative analysis that you run through, which are a little bit rarer in section three as well. Cool. All right, um, there we go. That's everything. So uh, nine questions. I'm trying to keep them relatively short and bite-sized so that the videos stay pretty short for the worked solutions. But as we build them up, they'll obviously do more and more. Um, if you're looking to do more of them, maybe you could wait a couple of weeks to let a few bank up and then you could do three in a row and have maybe about 30 questions or so um, and do it as a little mini test and then watch the videos to, to practice. 
Um, hopefully these again have been helpful. Leave me some feedback because I want to keep improving them as we go. Uh, and so, I mean, already I'm trying to I'm trying to change up the questions based on the, the feedback and that kind of thing. But uh, if you think that there's a particular area that has not yet been covered in one of these walkthrough videos, then let me know. If it's content related, let me know, and that will go into the uh, crash course videos. I'm trying to keep them very separate, where this is about strategy and question answering um, whilst and pacing and that kind of thing whilst the other one is really just about the general underlying principles and theory without as much question based analysis in them. Other than that um, I don't really have any I don't really do outros or anything like that so I'm just going to leave it there so it doesn't drag on and I will see you in the next one.